based on what we were just talking about, this will be the last Twitter poll. Um, you know, I basically said, you know, given the current talent that we have, you know, to maximize the talent, if you were the coach today, and this is essentially transitioning into Cat's Corner, uh, the poll that I did. So, Dave, if you were the, the coach today, given the talent that has been given to you by Carlos Bocanegra and the, in the front office, the way that it's shaped out over the last six plus, plus months with Rosetto, Jurgen Dom, all these uh, new folks that are coming in, A, what formation uh, would you go with uh, predominantly? And, and how would you morph? And, you know, what are some of the things that you would think about in terms of um, maximizing the talent of the players that you see on our roster today? 56% on our poll said that they wanted to go with the 4-2-3-1. Do you agree or you want something different? I actually don't think, I mean, uh, my recollection is that 4-5-1 was not in the poll. Um, I, I labeled it as a 4-2-3-1 just to be okay. a, you know, a little cheeky. <laughs> um, I'd play four, five, one. Um, and I would keep it simple. Um, so, you know, our team is not built with a classic striker at this point without Martinez. Um, maybe Kubo could be, you know, the one, um, but we have a lot of creative people behind them. And if, if you have people in the midfield, PD and, and Barco with pretty free reins, one on the right, one on the left behind them. And we're built to counterattack, you know, with speed on the wings. Now they have, they've, they've spent all this money with, with speed. You know, they've, they've got Brooks Lennon and they have um, Bello and they have Dam, you know, Jurgen Dam and they have um, Mulraney, right? So much pace, right? Not necessarily fabulous players, skillful players, you know, not the Gressels of the world that we had in the past or um, um, uh, who was the guy the first year who went to D.C. United? Oh, my goodness. Forgetting his name. Oh, yeah. Um, I can too. But, but anyway, um, but we had some guys with real skills and who could break people down. But these players are are, are athletic. Assad. They are – yeah, Assad, Emil Assad. Um they're athletic and they are strong and they're pacey and, you know, they're built to counter. Right. And so um, I would play it very, very simple, a four in the back, one defensive midfielder remedy sitting in front of them. I feel like our defenders are excellent. We could have without doing any of this, you know, what I consider garbage overthinking it just play a very very solid four in the back allow the the outside backs to go forward but only you know in an overlapping capacity not this flying up the wings or whatever so and who's really, your who's your four in the back um so it'd be Bello probably out left and Escobar out right and then the center to um certainly Robinson um and so. Probably Mesa. You could have walks, but I think that's a solid back four. Yeah. And if there's any weakness in it, you know, Mesa, maybe pace, um, uh, maybe walks in terms of reading the game a little bit, but um, Robinson has been just terrific. And any of those deficiencies, as long as you don't have people running at your back four, you're fine. And so if you sit remedy in front of them, we, I would say get up the field and you know, basically fight at midfield for the ball with those back f five, basically. And then as soon as we win it, the, the remaining five on the field go and have a lot of aggressive, but sitting back in a counterattack style where everybody goes and you don't know who's coming at you. Because if we're just being honest about how we're doing, if we're going to possess the game or whatever, um, we don't have the players who will break you down. You know, you're asking Brooks Lennon to beat a guy. You're asking, you know, Jurgen Dom. Uh, you're asking um, John or Jurgen Dom to, you know, you know, be skillful and take on a guy. They're not going to do it. They just don't have the talent, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah, I agree with that. Um, and by the way, um, now that we're talking about breaking people down with remedy in the midfield, having to play the role of our old friend Darlington Nagby, I guess, somewhat in that, that role. Um, did you see the goal that Nagby scored 
last week uh-huh. or when was that over the weekend? What Anybody who tracker. flips the ball up to themselves has some serious skill. Yeah. Um, we were texting uh, within the, the, the network here that we all miss that guy greatly. Um, still think he should have stayed, but uh, wanted to get home. Still crying a little bit inside. <laughs> um, all right, Dave, what else? Uh, what else do we have on the agenda here? Running out of, I'm running out of paper on my, my computer here. <laughs> well, so uh, our next opponent is um, what, oh, Mi- Miami, right? Or what else you got? Well, what I was going to say is that the, the timing of the coaching search, which is one yeah. something I All wanted right. to talk about. Um, it seems like, and I may be over reading this, but it seems like the Atlanta United organization is content to go with an interim manager for the remainder of the year and do a search in the off season. And the question I have to you, Mikey Dobbs, is why? Why are we not? Now, maybe we can't. Maybe they are aggressively finding, going after a new manager, and they can't find it. But it doesn't seem like it. I'll tell you why. Because they screwed it up so badly last time, they can't afford to, you know, make another awful decision like bringing in Frank DeBoer. I mean, that's the simplest way I can put it. I think you know, there's probably some options out there. Um, I also say with number two is that, you know, Eels and, and the team, they still wanted to go into this um, club with the thinking of just, again, thinking maybe bigger than any other club. Um, and maybe that's not um, excluding maybe some names that otherwise we would think it would be impossible. Um, I think they at least want to go on that hunt. Um, and give eels the way you know the the leeway to network and see what's possible. Um, I guess those are my two main answers. I, I usually would want to have a, a third, but um, and also, well, I guess the third is the fact that I mean, look, the dreaded the, third. The dreaded third is well, it's pretty easy, right? I mean, this season is somewhat of a wash, even though the trophy would look the same if there's a trophy. Um, but it's still like wait, 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 to, wait, wait. Why the, would you say the season is a wash? We we're three and three. The, at, at some point, there will be an asterisk on almost every sport this season, even though the players care just as sure. much and the, the fans want it. There just is. Um, it sucks, but I, I do think that that is there as an underlying theme. As much as we want baseball and, you know, what, if whatever happens with college football, it's probably going to be a tournament between the four ACC teams, which probably have been the – or uh, ACC and the SEC teams anyway. And, you know, whoever wins that probably would have won anyway. But – um, it just doesn't have the same impact. I don't know. It just doesn't. It's been a crappy so year. Do you, do you think that we, for example, so Barcelona passed on Pochettino. They took Ronald Koeman, yeah. um, an old De Boer teammate in the Dutch national team, um, who I think is very much a very similar coach to De Boer. So good luck, Barcelona. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, um, I, I I think that Pochettino didn't want the job because he knew. I mean, why take a dumpster fire based on a bunch of players that are you know big wages, uh, you know, in their thirties? I mean, they've got, and that's why Messi wants to leave. They know that they're in a complete rebuild, just like a baseball team. It's going to take you know three years before there's a light at the end of that tunnel. Do you think that Atlanta United made a run at Pochettino? Uh, I have no idea, um, honestly. I mean, it's all conjecture as far as I'm because concerned. there should be a connection. Darren Eels knew yeah. Pochettino from his Tottenham days. They should they know each other. Yeah, I guarantee. Like, yes, I think so. Yes, I think at some some level, some level of communication to Eels to him has probably happened to feel out the waters on whether that's even worth pursuing. So, yeah, I think so. Um, now, how much traction that has in, it has had in terms of being a real conversation, I have no idea. But I'm sure that I'm sure they took a swing in some capacity. One of the things that 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 continues to flabbergast me is that so much emphasis, even in this modern era, is still put on the playing career of the manager, right? 
So DeBoer gets credibility because he was a terrific player. Ronald Coleman gets credibility because he's a terrific player, right? Thierry Henry from, you know, yeah. Yeah, uh, and, the, and the question is, um, there are some examples, Guardiola being a, a classic one of Zenedine, a terrific Zidane. player. Zidane, you know. But for, for every one of them, there's probably 10 other examples. A Jurgen Klopp was a, nobody as a soccer player. A Mourinho, nobody as a soccer player, right? Why is there the the emphasis on the playing career for coaching? I see this even at the youth level. You know, all these parents are like, well, what did you do as a player? Does it really matter? All right. Thanks for listening. If anybody actually made it this far in the podcast, we'd love to hear your feedback on Twitter at ATL on fire. And tell your friends to subscribe. We are on iTunes, Google Play, and really any sort of podcast uh, platform that you're on.